There was a time way back when in the 1990s um, when the uh, Colorado State Legislature was in the process of putting into motion uh, new state standards for the very first time. And around that same time, um, emerged a whole bunch of new um, channels and networks on uh, cable, on, uh, in, in cable television land. And one of those was the History Channel. Now I gotta hold this the right direction. Um, the History Channel at that time, as I recall, 24-7, pretty much you got, you got war. You'd get a little bit of American Revolution, you'd get uh, 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 some ancient battles here and there, and you were guaranteed by the end of the day to get World War II. So much so that some folks started to refer to the History Channel as Hitler Channel. Uh, today, we don't get much Adolf on the, on the History Channel. He's off on the Sister Channel doing his thing. But instead, we get um, hairy bikers, we get swamp people, and we get the occasional alien friend of ancient civilizations. Um, so a, a very different kind of uh, a genre has emerged. And we're going to look at that intersection today, because what the History Channel has done is found the, uh, the profit and power of reality television. And they've, um, in, a, in a way, we see how that format interacts with, with history content. And so my question for us today, uh, as the, um, the keepers of the primary documents and as the coaches of historical inquiry, is there anything in that for us? We have to look at PBS as kind of the origin of this, and way back in the 1970s, they were doing reality television in a format that we're familiar with now, way ahead of their time. Uh, an American family is one of the first, kind of a sociological look at uh, um, just turning on the cameras on a family and seeing what's happened. Uh, and there's a whole um, host of, of, uh, of shows now that have pretty strong historical methodology and, and content involved, and some of them are here. Uh, so we have shows where we're tracing the DNA of of, of famous people typically back thousands of years to see their cultural and ancestral connections, things they had no idea about. Um, we'll see folks who are, um, I mean, we see shows where viewers provide questions and ideas for, for uh, forensic specialists and historians and anthropologists to go on kind of a, a great hero's in inquiry journey and see where that takes them and trying to figure out these mysteries. Uh, we see shows where we take 20th century and 21st century people, uh, put them in 19th and 18th century and an 19th or 18th century situation, and then see what happens to them after, after a year as we kind of spy into their world. And we also have the most popular program, most highly rated program in the last 20 years on PBS, uh, The Road Show. And in The Road Show, we've got the cool stuff and we've got all these experts in the room. Um, we've got um, the, the, the context and the history that comes with it. But unlike the other shows, we also have capitalism and, and hard cash. And what is this stuff worth? And as an audience member, you're engaged because you're trying to see if you can take these same clues and see if you can match up and, and have a sense of what the value is, just like the expert does. All of these shows have a lot of things in common. Um, they have strong academic um, connections to, to universities and museums. There's PhDs all over the place. Nobody's really questioning the folks behind the work and producing and the folks that are doing the work. There may be a question at times about the merit of some of the things that are being done. For example, in Pioneer House, it, can you really take 21st century people, put them in a 19th century context, but still have to adhere to 21st century policies. You can't go and hunt everything you want. You can't cut down everything that you want. So you get, and the resource base isn't the same as it was 150 years ago. We briefly uh, uh, interrupt this introduction to remember that Ken Burns made do documentary sexy and also brought um, experts into our living room like we were having a conversation with them. And this whole evolution, he's got a piece in that too, but that's another program another time. Um, now we're back to the History Channel again, and let's see, um, of these folks, who you recognize. Uh, please applaud if you've ever seen Barry on TV. How about Rick? How about uh, these folks? Uh, you're kind of going up with their ratings, by the way. You're following the Nielsen pattern. Uh, how about Rick Harrison? Eh, maybe he didn't quite make it. Rick's got about 8 million followers a week. 
Um, Barry is on the, sh on, the, on the show Storage Wars, and on Storage Wars we see um, these storage lockers that have been abandoned, haven't been paid for, some folks come in and do some bidding on it, whoever ends up with it ends up with the stuff, and then we find out the story about the stuff and how much it's worth. Strong connection back to the Antique Roadshow. Some of the items that show up on the Roadshow might have been in a locker on, on their way, the way back to PBS. Um, Barry is kind of the uh, senior sage and clown of the group, very much interested in all the odd and interesting items that come along, very much into the stories and the, and the relationships that happen, collaborates with all kinds of experts. He himself doesn't have a lot of formal training as far as, uh, as, far as history and, and, um, and archiving. Uh, he comes out of the produce industry and also has been a lifetime collector. Um, Rick's show, American Restoration, is all about taking cool stuff and making it look like it did in the past. And so he might be working on an old gas pump or on a motorcycle or on a, on a car, on a, on a sewing machine. Um, private folks come to him, tell, him, tell them what he wants. He makes it beautiful again, gets it back to its original uh, operating status. Uh, he takes some liberties at time, but I think for the most part he gets pretty high marks from the Preservation Society as far as kind of following protocol. Um, Mike, Danielle, and, and Frank, they're wandering the back roads of Middle America, going through the alleys and the, and, the, um, back, and, the, and the dirt roads, looking for piles of junk that they can buy and then sell for more. Um, but for them, some of the, the most fun and the most exciting piece, and I think what this show is starting to emphasize more and more, are the folks that they meet behind that stuff. And that's American Pickers. And then finally, Rick, I find him to be probably the most fascinating character in the group. Um, Rick is kind of the, the, the owner of a, of, a, of a pawn shop in, in Las Vegas, and it's all about the stuff that comes into their show, 8 million viewers a week, um, and, and the family, the relationships, and the, and the things that happen there. Um, Rick, um, as, a, as a kid, was, was sick and suffered with epilepsy. Uh, really got it. I mean, reading was his passion. Loved just reading. I mean, all about nonfiction, history of technology, history of science. Um, certainly, um, uh, the, the previous speaker would be somebody he would have been fascinated and wanted to dig in more. Loved learning, hated school, high school dropout. Um, and in his current book, um, he talks about the kind of things that he likes to read. And here's an example of kind of what's on his, on, might be on his bed stand. So we see things like about the rewarding story of risk, looking at boom and bust over time and the impact that great investment has had on human, human, human culture um, throughout time. Um, portable, portable energy and how that's transformed and changed the world. And mercury, the folks that got poisoned, the politics that, re, that, that evolved, all the different kinds of situations over time that have been, had a connection with mercury, gold, all kinds of um, different industries. Uh, so maybe the pawn shop isn't a bad place to go find in a story and to do some research with. Uh, one of the impressive things about Rick is uh, how he tries to substantiate, even if he thinks he's really solid about things, all the experts that he collaborates with. And hey, even local historians are uh, becoming noteworthy as a result of pawn stars. Um, Mark Hall Patton has a, has a degree in history, has degrees in museum um, studies. He oversees and administrates three, um, three museums in Clark County. Um, on one of the most common experts that comes on the show, he's, he never gives a value or puts a, puts a dollar value on things. It's all about the, 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 the story and the context and giving meaning to the, to the things that Rick may be selling in his store or, or purchasing. Um, Drew Max is a forensic document examiner, one of about oh, five or six that come in and out of the show. He's been getting a little less um, camera time here of late. Handwriting expert, spent years in the court. He's got a history degree, he's got a science chemistry degree. Um, and so even though some of these folks um, that are kind of up front on the camera don't necessarily have the academic side, they're employing folks and, and, and talking with folks that do. Uh, Rick Dale got his start on um, Pawn Stars as uh, the guy who they'd like to go to to restore stuff. So kind of to so what? So we got some people that have been buying some stuff, selling some stuff, telling some good stories. Does it mean anything for us as educators? Well, I think on the best side of it, we do, some, we do see some really nice practices of media literacy. We see some great questions being asked. We see people kind of demonstrating that consumer beware piece. You better make sure you've done your research. You better make sure you've checked your, on your facts uh, before you go out to make your claim. We see some interesting transfer. Not only does history get me somewhere academically, hey, it can be even worth some bucks. Um, and that um, it also has that sense of community and sense of place that comes with it. 
Uh, the stories become really important. There's a whole perseverance piece. Hey, I don't know something, but I know how to go about finding the answers and, and getting to a better tr uh, truth. We see aspects of society and culture that have been kind of ignored, at least in TV land for a long time. Um, and we're getting into some aspects of even parts of, of, of America that some people didn't think existed anymore. Uh, the whole collaboration piece, how much more 21st century can you get? We got people making deals and kind of bringing back the, um, the science of, of barter, uh, which is certainly maybe more alive and well in America than people might have thought. You've got inklings and uh, this, this threat of preservation. We see that material culture has a means to a bigger theme and context, potentially when these shows are done pretty well, and that's not necessarily always their mission. Um, and just that whole kind of aspect of, of, of origins. But there's a, there's a sad and dark side as well. Um, collectors, when the mental illness kicks in, become hoarders, and we have a whole other genre of, of TV programs around that. Certainly, we've got to help students figure out what's manufactured, what's what's scripted, what's faked, what's um, all done in the magic of the production and the, and the cutting and the putting together and the directing of, the, of these programs. The, these programs tend to capitalize on the uh, misfortunes of others, uh, whether it's at the, at the, at the storage or the, some of the folks that have the junk piled up in their yards. There's not always the best of historiography and the, the best methodologies being practiced, so it can certainly um, uh, be an issue there. And uh, especially in the commercial side of these kinds of programs, it's a really white world. Very few folks of color um, become the center of any of these stories, and I hope that's something that we see kind of change over time. In my little journey of kind of um, looking, I mean, um, investigating this a little bit, I came across this on the, um, uh, on the Roadshow website. And I think it's a, it's a nice little reminder of the power that things have. Uh, certainly in our culture, power, things have a lot of power. We are surrounded by things and we are surrounded by history. But too seldom do we use the artifacts that make up our environment to understand the past. Too seldom do we try to read objects as we read books. To understand the people and the times that created them, used them, and discarded them. In part, this is because it's not easy to read history from things. They are Ill illegible to those who know how to read only writing. They're mute to those who listen only for pronouncements from the past, but they do speak and they can read. And that's from History from, from Things, Essays on Material Culture. I want to leave you with a couple of questions when you get to your reflection time. Um, so, should teachers of history make use of shows like Pawn Stars and American Pickers? If so, how? And then kind of taking a bigger leap, um, and maybe this is a fun exercise to do with students. Uh, if you were to design a reality television program for the Library of Congress, how would you make it both educational and engaging? It'd be an interesting way to figure out all that's there. Uh, so the newest story is reality television and the junk drawer of America. Um, I hope you've enjoyed kind of thinking about that and look forward to having some conversations with you later. Thanks. Thank you.